just an amazing surprise. It was so sweet and, and natural and very romantic. He got on one knee. Of course. <laughs> was it an instant yes from you? Yes. As a matter of fact, I could barely let you finish proposing. Uh, I said, like, can I say yes now? She didn't even let me finish. She said, can I say yes? Can I say yes now? And then, then there was hugs and I had the ring in my finger. And I was like, can I, can I give you the ring? She goes, oh, yes, the ring. <laughs> Great Britain is rejoicing as a new royal wedding is once again on the horizon. Prince Harry, fifth in line to the throne, finally announced his engagement to American actress Miss Meghan Markle on November 27, 2017. The big day will be in the spring of 2018, and the venue? The spectacular Windsor Castle. In the lead up to this momentous occasion, this program will explore how these two unlikely lovers were brought together, how they became the most talked about couple in the world, and how they will shape the future of the British royal family. No, we're thrilled, thank you very much. Both of them. I hope they'll be very happy indeed. Absolutely thrilled. It's brilliant. And as I said, America's loss is our gain. William and I are absolutely thrilled. Uh, it's such exciting news. Um, it's a really happy time for any couple and we wish them all the best. My congratulations to Harry and Meghan. I wish them well, hope they have a great time and great fun together. And having met Harry a couple of times, I'm sure they're gonna have a great deal of fun together. It's amazing to think that, you know, she's walked our hallways and that someone as successful, as kind, as generous, as giving as Meghan, you know, has really rose up the ranks. The ring is yellow gold and the main stone itself um, I source from Botswana and the, uh, the little diamonds either side are from my mother's jewellery collection. Join us as we celebrate the engagement of Harry and Meghan, a Windsor wedding. Your Royal Highness, Meghan Markle, congratulations to you both. Thank you. Can we start with the proposal and the actual moment of your engagement? When did it happen? How did it happen? Uh, it happened uh, a few weeks ago, mm. um, earlier this month, here at, at our cottage. Um, it's just a standard, typical night just for us. It's a cosy night. It was, what were we doing? Just roasting chicken roasting and having... Chicken. <laughs> trying to roast a chicken. Trying to roast a chicken. And it was just... A, uh, just an amazing surprise. It was so sweet and and natural and very romantic. He got on one knee. Of course. <laughs> was it an instant yes from you? Yes. As a matter of fact, I could barely let you finish proposing. I was yeah. like, can I say yes now? She didn't even let me finish. She said, can I say yes, can I say yes now? And then, then there was hugs and I had the ring in my finger. And I was like, can I, can I give you the ring? She was, oh, yes, the ring. <laughs> so no, it was, um, it was a really nice moment. It was just the two of us. And um, I think I managed to catch, catch her by surprise as well. So. Yeah. And this is how long after you first met? Oh, it would be a year and a half, two, yeah. a little bit more than that. No, just about, about, about a year about and a half, that. yeah. Which for most people would be quite a whirlwind. Is that how it's felt to you? I don't think that I would call it a whirlwind uh, in terms of our relationship. Obviously, there have been layers attached to how public it has become um, after we had a good five, six months almost mm. with just privacy, which was amazing. Um, but no, I think we were able to really have so much time just to connect and we never went longer than two weeks without seeing each other even though we were obviously doing a long distance relationship so it's um we made it work how did you first meet uh mm. yes we first met we were introduced actually by a mutual friend who um we will we should protect our privacy protect and not our privacy, yeah. reveal too much of that and um but it was it was literally it was through her and then we met once and then twice back to back two dates in london Mm. Um, last July, yes, beginning of July, and then it was I think about three, maybe four weeks later, that I managed to <laughs> persuade her to come and join me in Botswana, and we 
and we, we, we camped out with each other under the stars and we spent Kevin and Johnny for five days out there, which was absolutely fantastic. So then we were really by ourselves, mm -hmm. um, which, I, which was crucial to me to make sure that we had a, a chance to, to get to know each other. Yeah. But the friend who introduced you, was she trying to set you up? Yes, it was definitely yes. a setup. <laughs> it was a blind date. Was a blind date and, for sure. and it's so interesting because we talk about it now and even then, I, you know, because I'm from the States, you don't grow up with the same understanding of, of the royal family. And mm. so while I now understand very clearly there's a, a global interest there, I didn't know much about him. And so the only thing that I had asked her when she said she wanted to set us up was, I had one question. I said, well, is he nice? Because if he wasn't kind, it just didn't, it didn't seem like it would make sense. And so we went and um, had a, met for a drink. And then I think very quickly into that, we said, well, what are we doing tomorrow? We should, yeah. we should meet again. What are we doing tomorrow? Let's meet again. And then it was like, right, diaries. We need to get the diaries out and find out how we're going to make this work because I was off to Africa for a month. Mm. Um, she was working and we just said, right, where's, where's the gap? And the gap happened to be in the perfect place. Um, so. so how much did you, Prince Harry, know about Meghan? Had you seen her on TV? No, I'd, I'd never, <laughs> never even heard about her until this friend said, Meghan Markle, I was like, right, okay, give me give me a bit of background, what's, <laughs> like what's going on here. So no, I'd never, I'd, I'd never watched Suits. I'd, I'd never heard of Megan before. Mm -hmm. And I was beautifully surprised when I, when I walked into that room and saw her and there she was sitting there. I was like, okay, well, I really have to up, up, up my game. <laughs> I'm gonna sit down and have a, and make sure I've got a good chat. I think for both of us, though, it was, it was really refreshing because given that I didn't know a lot about him, everything that I've learned about him, I learned through him, as opposed to having mm. grown up around different news stories or tabloids or whatever else, anything I learned about him and his family was what he would share with me and vice versa. So mm. for both of us, it was just a really authentic and organic way to get to know each other. And was that quite refreshing for you in the way that you've been brought up, you know, with a lot of people knowing a lot about you, was it refreshing? Or thinking they know. Or thinking they exactly. know. Exactly. Yeah, no, it was hugely refreshing to be able to get to, to know someone who isn't necessarily within your circle, doesn't know much about me, I don't know about much about her. So to be able to start almost afresh, right from the beginning and getting to know each other step by step, um, and then taking that huge leap of only two dates and then <laughs> and then going basically effectively on a holiday together nowhere. in the middle of nowhere mm -hmm. and you know showing a showing a tent together and all that kind of stuff it was no it was it was fantastic it was absolutely amazing to get to know her mm -hmm. um, as, as quickly as I did and starting a long distance relationship you were working on suits you had I imagine a packed filming schedule you've mm -hmm. got lots of commitments of your own how hard was it to keep things going <sighs> it was yeah it was just a choice right I think that very early on when we realized we were going to commit to each other that we knew we had to invest the time and the energy and whatever it took to make that happen yeah. and um so yes with the filming schedule it was not the easiest because it of course included a lot of travel back and forth but i don't think you've had any idea what time zone you've been on for the last year and a half no <laughs> coming over here four days or a week and then going back and then straight into filming the next day 4 a.m. wake up calls on a Monday, oh, yes. straight into set, you know. And right just, off the plane and straight to set and yeah, just coming back I'm just, back trying, and to, just trying to stay as close as possible, but you know, in, on, on two different time zones and five hours apart does have its challenges. But, mm. um, but we, you know, we made it work and, 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 and now we're here, so we're thrilled. But in the case of your relationship, unlike for most people, there's this whole layer of what it means to get involved with someone from the royal family. Mm -hmm. How much of a sense did you have Megan, of the enormity of what you were getting into, what it might mean for your life. I think I can very safely say, as naive as it sounds now, mm. having gone through this learning curve in the past year and a half, I did not have any understanding of just what it would be like. I don't think either of us did that. We both said that, even though we knew yeah, that I, it would be. Yeah, I tried to. I tried. I tried to warn. I tried to warn you as much as possible. Mm. But I think both of us were totally surprised by the the reaction after the first five, six months of when we had to ourselves of what actually happened from then. So I think you can you can have as many conversations as you want and try and prepare as much as possible. But we were we were totally un unprepared for, for what happened after that.
Meghan Markle was born in Los Angeles, California on August 4, 1981. Her African-American mother, Doria Radlin, has a master's degree in social work and works as a psychotherapist. Her Caucasian father, Thomas Markle, is an Emmy Award-winning lighting director. When Megan was just six years old, her parents divorced. Growing up in the Hollywood area of Los Angeles, Megan attended private schools. Immaculate Heart High School is an all-girl private Catholic school in LA where Megan spent many of her young years. This morning I woke up and I saw the news and I was really excited and I knew that our school community would be very excited because a few of us have been, you know, following the relationship and the buzz around school was that she was engaged to Prince Harry and so I went on the announcements, um, I spoke of the news and everybody was really excited. When she was a student here, she was very involved in uh, many different activities. She was here for middle school and high school, and so um, so seven years of of commitment to the school. When you know we're we've been here for 112 years, and so we have thousands of alums, and we're very proud of what we hope we have instilled in them: this sense of great heart and right conscience, and being able to make a change in the world for the better. She has been an outspoken uh, supporter of women's rights and equity for women, and um, I think I think she's going into a situation that will just give her more opportunities to even do much better and more important work. It's amazing to think that, you know, she's walked our hallways and that someone as successful, as kind, as generous, as giving as Megan, you know, has really uh, rose up the ranks. And that's extremely inspiring for all of us here, especially at an all-girls school, because she's just the definition of, you know, who we aspire to. In 2003, Megan graduated from Northwestern University near Chicago, earning a bachelor's degree with a double major in theater and international studies. She has said that her interest in theater and the arts began back when her father took her onto the set of Married with Children. Uh, there was a show called Married with Children. Do you seen it? Seen show? it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, I grew up on the set of Married with Children every day after school for ten years. I was there. Wow. I know. It's a very perverse place for a little girl who went to Catholic school, no less, to grow up <laughs> because I'm there in my school uniform, right? Oh yeah. And then the guests. <laughs> Her first appearance on screen was as an extra in the U.S. soap General Hospital. She continued taking small roles, appearing in Century City, The War at Home, and CSI New York. She even took on the role as Briefcase Girl in the U.S. game show Deal or No Deal. Megan remarked on her difficulty getting acting roles. She said, I wasn't black enough for the black roles, and I wasn't white enough for the white ones, leaving me somewhere in the middle as the ethnic chameleon who couldn't book a job. Her big break finally came in July 2011, when she landed the role of Rachel Zane in the USA Network show Suits. You know what nobody likes? Nobody likes a show off. You use the word ogling. <laughs> part of what I love about her and part of what we get to see this season is her career aspirations really starting to peak and um, really just following her ambitions outside of the office. So it's great. It's really an empowering season for Rachel. I love playing her. There's a misconception that because I have worked in the entertainment industry that this would be something I would be familiar with. But even though I'd been on my show for, I guess, six years at that point, and working before that, I've never been part of tabloid culture. I've never been in pop culture to that degree and, and lived relatively quiet life, even though I focus so much on my job and, um, so that was a really stark mm -hmm. difference out of the gate. But, um, and I think we were just hit so hard at the beginning with a lot of mistruths that I made the choice to not read anything, positive or negative. It just didn't make sense. And instead we focused all of our energies just on nurturing our relationship. On us. Yeah. On us. Yeah. And some of that scrutiny 
and you ended up making a very public statement about it. Some of that scrutiny was centred around your ethnicity, mm. Megan. When you realised that, what did you think? Of course, it's disheartening. You know, it's it's um, it's a shame that that is the climate in this world to focus that much on that, or that that would be discriminatory in that sense. But I think. You know, at the end of the day, I'm really just proud of who I am and where I come from. And we have never put any focus on that. We've just mm -hmm. focused on who we are as a couple. And so when you take all those extra layers away and all of that noise, um, I think it makes it really easy to just enjoy being together and mm -hmm. tune all the rest of that out. But now that it is all official, Prince Harry, do you have that sense that the combination of the two of you, your different backgrounds, that you together represent something new for the royal family? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it's something new. I think it's, um, you know, it's a, for me, it's a, an added member of the family. It's, a, it's, a, it's another, another team player as part of the, the bigger team. And, you know, for all of us, what we want to do is be able to carry out um, the right engagements, carry out mm -hmm. our work and try and encourage others and the younger generation to be able to see the, the world in, in the correct sense rather than um, perhaps being just having a, a distorted view. So, you know, the fact that I the fact that I fell in love with Megan so incredibly quickly was a was sort of confirmation to me that that everything everything all the stars were aligned, everything was just perfect. Botswana, the country where Harry and Meghan camped out beneath the stars, holds a special place in the prince's heart. He has said before that Africa is where I feel more like myself than anywhere else in the world. And he calls Botswana his second home. Africa has played a significant role in the history of the royal family. In 1952, then Princess Elizabeth was in Kenya on a tour of the Commonwealth with her husband when the announcement that King George VI had died catapulted her to the head of the family at just 25 years old. Kenya was also where Harry's brother, Prince William, proposed to then Kate Middleton while on holiday in 2010. Prince Harry's genuine love for Africa is rooted in his charity work. In 2003, after completing his exams at Eton College, Harry went to the continent to continue the charitable legacy of his mother, Diana Princess of Wales. His optimism, patience, and love endeared him to the children he worked with. Harry would return to Africa in 2006 and found Centabale, a charity focused on the areas he had become so closely involved. Um, thank you, High Commissioner, for your very kind words and introduction. Um, Dumela, Vice President, ladies and gentlemen, as the High Commissioner said, Botswana is a country very close to my heart. The fact that I spend more time here than at home worries my father a lot. <laughs> um, for years now, I've been coming back here, drawn by the country's beauty and the friendliness of all its people here. My brother William arrives here tomorrow, unfortunately, and this will be the first overseas tour that we have been on together. It is no accident that we so wanted this to be here in Botswana, in this beautiful country. And listening to the High Commissioner describe all the common ties that we share and have always shared, not least the values and fellowship of the Commonwealth, only reinforces my love for this country alongside Britain. It was, it was um, I hate to say it, it was quite fun um, traveling around Africa with Harry. Um, and I was really glad I got a chance to see Senator Bali um, because I think he's done a fantastic job with it um, from, you know, starting from scratch. But I, several things I'll take away is, is is really meeting new people again, um, seeing the Herb Boys, I thought they were fantastic. And, and that was probably the most moving bit for me was seeing those guys. Um, I think they have a very, very hard time and Centre Body does a lot for them.
Prince Harry's military experience was fraught with security concerns. He joined Sandhurst in 2005, and in 2006, it was announced that he would be deployed to Iraq the following year. This led to a fierce public debate. In May, just before the prince was scheduled to be deployed, the head of the British Army, General Sir Richard Dinat, announced that Harry would be too high value a target and endanger his fellow soldiers, thus would not be deployed. I have decided today that Prince Harry will not deploy as a troop leader with his squadron. I've come to this final decision following a further and wide round of consultation, including a visit to Iraq for myself at the end of last week. There have been a number of specific threats, some reported, some not reported, which relate directly to Prince Harry as an individual. These threats expose not only him, but also those around him to a degree of risk that I now deem unacceptable. Now that I've decided that he will not be deploying with his troop, the risks faced by his battle group are no different to those faced by any other battle group or other of our servicemen in Iraq. Let me also make quite clear that as a professional soldier, Prince Harry himself will be extremely disappointed by this decision. He has proved himself both at Sandhurst and in command of his troop during their training. And I commend him for his determination and his undoubted talent. And I don't say that lightly. I wouldn't have joined the army unless I thought I was going to. Um, simple as that. Um, if if they said no, you can't go front line, then I wouldn't I wouldn't drag my sorry ass through Sandhurst, and I wouldn't I wouldn't be where I am now. In February 2008, the British Ministry of Defence revealed that Harry had been secretly deployed to Helmand Province in Afghanistan. There, he operated as a forward air controller. He helped Gurkha troops repel an attack from Taliban insurgents and patrolled hostile territories. <laughs> Harry attended the Defense Helicopter Flying School at RAF Shawbury, joining his brother William, who was completing his training to be a search and rescue pilot. How much of a struggle has it been? Um, I think the, the struggle that I was talking about was mainly the exams and stuff like that. When you, when you sort of, the helicopter course, you start with or something like four or five weeks of uh, ground school and exams. Um, exams never been my favorite, and I always knew that I was going to find it harder than most people, um, but I'm through that now. And uh, finally got hands on to, uh, to a job that I absolutely adore. It is still hard work, but, um, but I'm better than William, so it's fine. <laughs> yeah, it's that You've been helping him with the exam? Uh, yeah, an awful lot. He needs a lot of help. It's, uh, yeah, it's the RAF way, so you have to help the army out quite a lot. And does it come down to sort of mental maths tests? Or? Uh, yeah, a bit of that, you know, a few trick questions, try and catch them out. Seven, eights. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> lots of that. <laughs> but how seriously is it for you? Is this fundamentally and crucially about getting back to the front line? Um, it is. I've always had a love for helicopters. Um, I've always wanted to be a pilot, mainly of helicopters, more than fixed wing, even though it's slightly under the impression that fixed wings probably easier than helicopters, especially as these things aren't designed to fly. But um, I'm really enjoying it. And, you know, as, as everyone knows, it is my easiest way of getting back onto the front line. Um, and maybe safer, maybe not safer, I don't know. Um, but there's a bit of pressure from, from certain places, which I'm sure you're aware of, of the reasons why I'm allowed to go back. And if I do go back, then apparently I can't do the same job as I had. So I'm looking somewhere different. And, more, more of a challenge to try and become a helicopter pilot. Was it made pretty clear to you after the last time in Afghanistan that it would be your first and last time, that it was too risky for you to go back as a, as a soldier? Uh, more of the fact that I think the media had said that they would never keep their mouths shut um, if I went and did the same job, so I'd have to do something different if I wanted to go, yes. But you are hopeful, confident and, and passionate that you do get back by this means, that you get back to the front line? Massively so, unless they stop flying helicopters out in Afghanistan soon, which hopefully they won't do, but, you know, as I said, I love flying helicopters, or I'm loving flying helicopters at the moment. I just hope that I can be better than better than the best. You know, that's what I always strive to be, to be, you know, spot on. But, you know, as I said, to get out to Afghanistan again would be fantastic. And my best chance is to be a helicopter, is to do it from a helicopter. And so you, you got off the ground yet? Sorry? You got off the ground I yet? I just got off the ground, yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thanks for asking. Sorry, just, sorry. The fact that she, I, I know the fact that she'll be really unbelievably good at the job part of it as well, um, is obviously a huge relief to me because she'll be able to deal with, 
with everything else that comes with it. But um, mm. no, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're a fantastic team. We know we are. And, and we'll, we, we hope to, you know, over time, try and have as much impact for all the things that we care about as, as much as possible. I am and, very excited about that, yeah. And Megan, given your, your acting and the profile you had, you'd already been involved in various causes. You've been an ambassador for UN Women. Mm. What about this new role? I mean, you're going to have an, a bigger platform, a bigger voice. What do you want to do with it? I mean, how <laughs> can you imagine? No, I'm not a singer. Um, I think what's been really exciting as we talk about the transition of this out of my career, but into the role is that, as you said, the causes that have been very important to me, I can focus even more energy on because very early out of the gate, I think you realize once you have access or a voice that people are willing to listen to with that comes a lot of responsibility, mm-hmm. which I take seriously. And at the same time, I think in these beginning few months and now being boots on the ground in the UK, I'm excited to just really get to know more about the different communities here, smaller organizations who are working on the same causes that I've always been passionate about under this umbrella. And um, and also being able to go around to the Commonwealth. I think it's just mm. just the beginning of a... There's a lot to do. Really. There's a lot to do. <laughs> and it's an immense change. You're, you're getting a new country out of it, mm-hmm. um, a, a husband, obviously, but also giving up, giving... <laughs> giving up Sounds your nice. career yes, it's nice. yes. yes. but I, I don't see it as giving anything up i just see it as a it's change a, it's, a new, it's a new challenge it's a new, it's a new chapter from the moment the rumors began the press hounded the couple at every opportunity within days articles and exposés emerged throughout the world media revealing the personal life of the possible new princess. Meghan Markle was previously married to actor and producer Trevor Engelson. The two met in 2004 and were together for six years before they married, although it was not meant to be, and their marriage only lasted for two years. But the pursuing press did not stop there, and they began to push the focus onto Meghan's ethnicity. In the days that followed, Prince Harry issued a pointed public statement condemning the disgraceful reporting. Meghan Markle has been subject to a wave of abuse and harassment. Some of this has been very public. The smear on the front page of a national newspaper and the outright sexism and racism of social media trolls and web article comments. Harry reads everything that's written about him um, and about those in his life to the point where he actually will talk to you and mention things that you've written about that he doesn't like. He's an avid follower of the press. Um, Yes, of course, that would have driven things that he would have read last week over the last week about uh, Meghan Markle that he hasn't liked, the racial undertones he's talked about, the outright sexism that's been in some of the coverage, that will have stung him to the heart. And I think that is what's prompted this very unusual statement from him. Meghan Markle has often discussed how racism has affected her family. Writing for Elle magazine, she said, being biracial paints a blurred line that is equal parts staggering and illuminating. While my mixed heritage may have created a gray area surrounding my self-identification, keeping me with a foot on both sides of the fence, I have come to embrace that, to say who I am, to share where I'm from, to voice my pride in being a strong, confident, mixed-race woman. I've been working on my show for seven years. Um, So we are very, very fortunate to be able to have that sort of longevity on a series. And for me, once we hit the 100 episode marker, I thought, you know what, I have I have ticked this box and I feel really proud of the work I've done there. And now it's time to, as you said, work work as a team mm. with, with mm-hmm. you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But do you have that sense of responsibility, Prince Harry, for what, you, for what you're asking Meghan to do? Of course, um, that sense of responsibility was, was essentially from day one or mm-hmm. maybe a couple of months in when I suddenly realized actually this is, you know, I've, I've, I feel I know that I'm in love with this girl and I hope that she's in love with me, but we still had to sit down on the sofa and I still, you know, I still had to have some pretty, you know, frank conversations with her to say that, you know, what you're letting yourself in for is, Mm. it is, it's it's a big, it's a big deal. And it's, um, you know, it's not, I wouldn't, it's not, it's not easy for anybody. Um, But I know that 
you know, at the end of the day, she she chooses me and I choose her. Um, and therefore, you know, whatever whatever we have to tackle together or individually will always be us together as a team. So I think I think she's capable it's so of so nicely said, isn't it? You know, I don't know. She's capable of she's capable of anything. Um, and together, as I said, there's there's a hell of a lot of stuff and work that needs doing. Um, at the moment for us it's gonna be making sure that our relationship is always put first. But um no that both of us have passions for for, for for wanting to make change, change for good. And, uh, you know, with lots of young people running around the Commonwealth, that's where we're going to spend most of our time, hopefully. And it was really one of the first things we connected on. It was one of the yeah. first things we started talking about when we met was just the different things that we wanted to do in the world and how passionate we were about seeing change. I think that was, um, mm. that's what got date two <laughs> in the books, probably. Yeah, Plenty to talk about. Mm. Children? Not, not currently, no. Um, no, of course, you know, I think, um, you know, one, one, th- one step at a time and hopefully we'll, we'll start a family in the near future. Have you you've met each other's families, I imagine? Yes, his family's been so welcoming and, and... You've met quite a few of them, actually. I have, on both sides of his family, his mom's yeah. side as well, which has been really important to me too. But um, yes, the family has been great and over the past year and a half... We've just had a really nice time getting to know them and progressively helping me feel a part of of not just the mm. institution, but also part of the family, which has been really, um, really special. Trying to track them down and make sure that they're around at the same time that she's popping in without telling too many people. And uh, <laughs> so we've, we've managed, we've actually done incredibly well um, to make sure that you've met all the, all the key people. So does that mean a lot of the time that you've been together in this last year and a half, you've been, you've been at home a lot? Yes. yes. No, we've, we've, uh, well, yeah, we had to re- sort of reverse the whole process and cosy nights in in front of the television, cooking dinner with um, you know, just the two of us by ourselves in our mm. little cottage, um, rather than going out for dinner and being seen in public. So we we have we reversed the whole process, which is it's 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 provided different opportunities mm. and it's made us a hell of a lot closer in a shorter space of time. That's I can, true. That's you know without question. So. You know, if anybody else at home is listening, then maybe you know, slow down on the dates and maybe spend more time at home. But um, no, it's it's for us. It's it's an opportunity to to really get to know each other without other people, you know, looking or trying to take photos on their phones and all that kind of stuff. You know, with that that comes that comes comes with the comes with the job comes with the role. But um, well, where so possible, yeah. yeah. And we were able to really get to know each other that way. Yeah. But also then to go and have friends over for dinner or to yeah. go to his family's for tea or. Yeah any of those sort of things and even you know just to take the take the time to be able to go on long country walks and mm. um and oh, just talk all, yeah, we've been all over the place have you met the queen i have yes a couple of times yes, what was that true, like? a couple of times um it's incredible i think you know a to be able to meet her through his lens not just with his honor and respect for her as the monarch but the love that he has for her as his grandmother all of those layers have been so important for me so that when I met her, I had such a deep understanding and of course, incredible respect for being able to have that time with her. And and we've had a really, she's she's an incredible woman. And the, and the corgis took you straight away. <laughs> That's true. For the last 33 years being barked at, this one walks in absolutely <laughs> Just nothing. laying on just my feet during tea, it was tails, very sweet. <laughs> That has to be a, a good sign. Speaking of dogs, have you brought yours to the UK? Uh, well, I have two dogs that I've had for quite a long time, both uh, my rescue pups, and one is now staying with very close friends, and my other little guy is, yes, he's in the UK. He's been here for a while. Okay, let's hope he adjusts well. I think he's doing just fine. The platform for change that comes with royalty cannot be understated. Each member of the royal family valiantly patrons several charities, and the work they do is critical in shining a spotlight on the ailments of society. Meghan Markle will join the royal family with a long history of charity work under her belt. This is what they started to say. She said, this is what got us to date two, which is quite interesting. This is what they dreamed of doing. They've obviously both got this love of Africa. She said she wanted to get involved with charities over here and push the things that she believes in, gender equality, caring for children in Africa. You saw her barefoot in Africa, in Rwanda. She's obviously a very modern and, of course, very American 
star who's obviously very ready to pick up the reins of doing what she can to help the world. At age 11, Megan garnered national attention in the States when she was angered by sexism in TV commercials and became publicly active in promoting equality. 20 years on, she would make a powerful speech to the UN in her capacity as women's advocate for participation and leadership. Women need a seat at the table. They need an invitation to be seated there. And in some cases, where this isn't available, well, then you know what? Then they need to create their own table. There's no doubt that the engagement and future marriage of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle will blow a refreshing new life into the royal family. A modern couple for a modern generation, no longer pinned down by the dated traditions of old, but setting the tone for the future of the royal family, changing and growing with the rest of society. One comparison to be made is King Edward VIII. In 1936, after less than a year as king and never having a coronation, Edward abdicated, passing on the crown to his younger brother who would become King George VI. The reason for the abdication? Love. Edward was engaged to be wed to an American, Miss Wallace Simpson. However, Miss Simpson had been twice divorced, with both husbands still living, and the Church of England wholly forbade the notion of a woman with such history sitting beside the king as queen consort. Twenty-five years ago, the romance of the century reached full flower at a castle in Mont, France. There, the king who abdicated his throne married the woman he loved. The Duke of Windsor and Mrs. Wallace Warfield Simpson, the king and the commoner, became man and wife. The duke had succeeded his father, King George, on the throne of England until, in a speech beginning with the famous words, at long last, he gave up his throne rather than give up marriage to Mrs. Simpson. It was a romance that rocked the empire, but it thrilled the world, and every step of their honeymoon received full play in newspapers around the globe. Twenty-five years later, they are still constant travelers, and they have returned many times to the scene of their Venetian honeymoon, the storybook romance of King and Commoner. Over a decade later, there was trouble at the palace again when Princess Margaret fell in love with Group Captain Peter Townsend. In 1952, Margaret's father died. Her sister became queen, and Townsend divorced his first wife. Early the following year, he proposed to Margaret. Many in the government believed he would be an unsuitable husband for the queen's 22-year-old sister, and the Church of England refused to countenance a marriage to a divorced man. Now, decades on, society has changed, and Prince Harry will be wed to no grievance. Your ring. Oh, yes. Tell us about your ring. Um, the ring is, is obviously yellow gold, because that's what, um, her favourite. And the main stone itself, um, I source from Botswana. And the, uh, the little diamonds either side are from my mother's jewellery collection to make sure that she's with us on this on this crazy journey together. Mm. Um, and It's beautiful. And he designed yeah. it. It's incredible. Um, yeah. Yeah. Make sure it stays on that finger. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> what does it mean to you, Megan, to have those stones on your finger that once belonged to Princess Diana? I, I think everything about um, Harry's thoughtfulness is and the inclusion of that and obviously not being able to meet his mom, it's so important to me to, to know that she's a part of this with us. And, and I think in being able to meet his aunts and, and also to be like Julia mm. and mm. just different people who are so important to his mom, I'm able to in some way know a part of her through them and mm. of course through him. And it's, um, it's incredibly special. And 
you know, to be able to have this, which sort of links where you come from and Botswana, which is important to us. And it's, uh, it's perfect. What do you think your mother would have thought of Megan or said about Megan? Oh, these would be thick as thieves, <laughs> without question. I think she would be over the moon, jumping up and down, you know, so excited for, for me. But then, as I said, it would have probably been best friends, best friends with Megan. So no, it's, I, you know, it's, it is days like, days like today when, when I really miss having her around and miss being able to share the, the happy news. But, you know, with, with the ring and with everything else that's going on, I'm sure she's, uh, she's with us. I'm sure she's with us, yeah, you know, jumping up and down somewhere else. Prince Harry's childhood is one of turmoil and tragedy, as the son of one of the most infamous royal relationships of the 20th century. What was your instant impression, both of you? What well, do you think I, about Lady Diana? Well, I remember thinking what a very jolly and amusing and, and attractive 16-year-old she was. And I mean, great fun, yeah. and dancing, and full of life, and everything. And um, um, I don't know what you thought of me. Pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> the British royal family has long upheld a reputation of silence and distance. After generations of privileged ignorance, one woman was to challenge all expectations and rewrite the royal rule book. That woman was Lady Diana Spencer. Can, is there any possibility of any announcement of your marriage in the near future? Can you tell me? Can you tell me if there's any possibility? I'm not going to say anything. Please. Right, but Prince Charles did give us a hint himself. He said we wouldn't have to wait too long. <laughs> On July 29, 1981, Lady Diana married Prince Charles and became Her Royal Highness the Princess of Wales in one of the most extravagant weddings in modern history. Prince William was born on the 21st June, 1982. Two years later, his brother, Prince Henry Charles Albert David, more commonly known as Prince Harry, was born. The boys were incredibly close to their mother, and it was important to her that they were not brought up inside a bubble of royal privilege. Against established protocol, she took her sons to charity visits, as well as restaurants, theme parks, and local towns and shops. They would watch TV shows and play video games together, despite criticism from within the royal household. She instilled within them an understanding and respect for the everyday person and those less fortunate. The Wales marriage was infamously turbulent, and by the late 80s, it was becoming increasingly clear that the cracks were forming behind the happy family facade. Finally, in 1996, after four years of separation, Prince Charles and Princess Diana divorced. Undeterred by the loss of her royal title, Her Royal Highness Diana committed herself to extensive charity work, including an incredibly successful campaign against anti-personal land mines. She was able to use her favoring in the press to her advantage and bring to light issues of suffering and disease across the world. Diana, Princess of Wales, has been seriously injured in a car accident in Paris. Her companion, the Haradzair Dodi Al-Fayed, has been killed. The driver of the princess's car is also understood to be dead. 
The accident happened at just after midnight in the west of the city near the Alma Bridge. On August 31st, 1997, Diana, Princess of Wales, was killed in a car accident. The driver of the car, Henry Paul, lost control at high speed and struck the 13th column of Lalma Tunnel. Diana died four hours later in hospital from extensive internal injuries. First, I want to pay tribute to Diana myself. She was an exceptional and gifted human being. In good times and bad, she never lost her capacity to smile and laugh, nor to inspire others with her warmth and kindness. I admired and respected her, for her energy and commitment to others, and especially for her devotion to her two boys. This week at Balmoral, we have all been trying to help William and Harry come to terms with the devastating loss that they and the rest of us have suffered. No one who knew Diana will ever forget her. Millions of others who never met her, but felt they knew her, will remember her. William was 15. Harry was 12. Their world would never be the same. Prince Harry's teenage years saw him struggle through school and struggle to cope against a hounding press. He has never had a good relationship with the press and has admitted that he holds resentment for how they treated his mother. Do you sort of have the three Harrys, really? The, the sensitive little boy, the fighting man, and, and the idiot. <laughs> and I think people love him for all three of those things. He always yes. smiles, he has a positive. Yes. He's so happy every day, every time. Yes. And uh, that's why he, we love him. <laughs> he looks gorgeous. Um, I think he's divine. I think it's probably very difficult being the second son because you don't really have a defined role. You're just the, the joker in the pack. The, the, the attention is very much focused on the eldest child, as it was with William. I mean, Diana made a very conscious effort not to allow that to happen, but of course it did. Harry became important by, you know, being this big character, being this brave boy. So I think it is, it, do, it does affect these kids. I mean, when you look at Princess Margaret, she never found the happiness she should have done. She was always completely in the shadow of her elder sister because her elder sister was queen. And when you think of the queen's children, and Princess Anne said she used to feel like an also ran. Harry is a party creature. He always will be. Um, so obviously he's going to get caught out. And then, of course, there's the notorious strip uh, at Vegas, which was really, really wild. Um, every misdemeanor that Harry's had has sort of leaked out to the press because we all want to see Harry being Harry. At the more family and children that William and Kate have and the more sort of mumsy she gets, the more, the more people are going to want naughty Harry. So I don't see any respite for him, I really don't. I think people are gonna want more of Harry. From 2005 to 2010, Harry was seeing Zimbabwean national Chelsea Davy. In 2012, he dated Cressida Bonas for two years. Both relationships collapsed because the royal outsiders could not deal with the overwhelming press and public attention. 
Chelsea and, and Cressida, I both loved him very much and, and they both probably felt differently about it, but neither of them fancied that kind of life. In 2016, he finally met Meghan Markle. In 2011, Harry's brother Prince William married Catherine Middleton to great joy and jubilation. Just under a week after the announcement of the couple's engagement, Meghan Markle was in the city of Nottingham on her first royal visit. Of course, Prince Harry was by her side as she took her first steps as an official member of the British royal family. Smiling crowds lined the streets and cheers filled the air. Meghan even caused somewhat of a fashion storm as her choice of coat and handbag for the event became an instant fashion craze, selling out online. She ranked among the top 10 fashion influences of the year, just behind celeb stars such as Rihanna. Life will never be the same for the Suits actress now that she's agreed to marry Prince Harry. In fact, the engaged couple must go through some major changes to prepare for their big day. And their life together after the wedding will be even more complicated. Meghan will have to take on royal duties, so will no longer work as a commercial actress. She will have to go through intensive protocol training before each event she attends. This includes British dining and afternoon tea events. When she meets representatives from foreign countries, she must know how to meet and greet them. Meghan will also need to learn things like how to curtsy. She will become a patron of most likely a few charities or causes she finds important. These will be officially announced by the palace. In the beginning, she'll be joined by Harry and perhaps Kate and or Camilla to do charitable and state events. They'll let her get used to royal protocol before sending her out on her own to do events, walkabouts and speeches, which is similar to the Duchess of Cambridge's experience. Oh yay! Oh yay! Oh yay! Buckingham Palace proudly announced the engagement of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. God save the Queen! Harry, you know, has been a bit of a wild card, and they're all of a sudden, the boy's engaged, and I, I think that's absolutely, you know, it's, it's fantastic. I'm so, ex so excited about it. This is just the engagement, the wedding itself, I'm sure, especially Harry, because he's very well loved, and I think it's wonderful for them both. I'm so pleased for them. Well, you're gonna have an American princess again. I think that is terrific. And I think Meghan Markle exudes all the good that is in American confidence. She's well-spoken, she's well-educated, and most of all, it appears she's making Prince Harry very, very happy. It's a great gift we're giving to Great Britain. Prince Harry's future bride is set to undergo training with the SAS so that she is fully prepared for all situations. The life as she was once used to has now changed forever. Grace Kelly certainly had to give up a far more impressive career uh, to become the Princess of Monaco. Um, even the Countess of Wessex had to give up her job. They tried that she'd be allowed to have her career after she got married and it didn't work out well. So this is her new job. I mean, being a royal isn't just getting married and going and putting on tiaras from time to time. It's a full-time occupation. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle are an enduring love story to us all. Nottingham Cottage, within the grounds of Kensington Palace, is where the lovers will choose to make their home and enjoy their future together. A future which will surely be a happy one. Prince Harry, Meghan Markle, thank you both very much. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you.